Building upon what we've seen in the progression from the Romanesque chapter, we can see a lot of uh, interesting developments in the strengthening language of uh, Christian art. Um, we're going to focus on France because it is France where we see the greatest concentration of uh, Gothic cathedrals. And now more than ever, I would ask you to consider using your imagination to just think how these spaces would have been for people in that time. While we don't really discover uh, new things, what we can see is innovation and refinement of existing techniques and elements in their work. The earliest example of this is at St. Denis, where the original cathedral was rather more of a transept, a cruciform typed, uh, a, a transept uh, given to a cruciform type building. With the additions in the following centuries, it becomes more of a bulky, blocky building that we would associate with an original basilica rather than the cruciform uh, basilica. We still have, though, the apse and the radiating chapel around it, and the aisles now are more pronounced. Um, this was a very popular style in France, and um, while some refer to it as French work, the original term Gothic had a bit of a negative connotation. Now, why is that? Well, we don't have to necessarily get into detail as to why, but just understanding that Gothic is not about, you know, um, darkness and the macabre of what we might associate with it now. Um, the style would spread to other countries, and those countries would, of course, apply their own influence and style, stylistic preferences. To understand the basic skeleton or framework of the Gothic style, we need to first remember those key elements, like the ribbed vaults, like the flying buttresses, and the buttresses themselves have now grown taller and stronger to help hold up that ribbed vault, and the flyer is now more prominent and made more famous in so many of these churches. And it is the flyer which helps give that additional height. It is the flyer and that height which lead me to three very important words when understanding the Gothic cathedral. Those three words are these, height and light. As we look at these churches developing, I think you'll see the connection between increased height and a desire for more light. Now, of course, these churches weren't built by priests or just the congregation alone. They were built by guilds. Guilds being perhaps groups of people in a particular trade, groups of people in a particular practice, masons, uh, window makers, um, those guilds, sometimes coming from out of town or out of the city in which the cathedral is made, would need housing. They would need food. They would need, you know, equipment and materials. And so these cathedrals were monumental works, monumental feats. Remembering where the Gothic cathedral started, remembering the Romanesque elements, we see a church that does not have much decoration on the outside, in fact, very little. The things that we can see developing from that, though, are the Gothic elements of the two towers flanking the gabled roof in the middle. There's still that large uh, rectangular uh, element, which is the heavy Romanesque building, but now uh, we're going to see, as we proceed into the age of cathedrals, more outside decoration. You'll see here also the number of three being repeated very often, uh, and uh, windows pointing up, these lancet windows always leading our eye up to the heavens. In England, though, uh, height and light weren't always the de facto um, goals of the Gothic cathedral. We can see, we can still see though, even though it's a different shape, the two towers, the gabled roof, the lancet windows, the repetition of three, and the manipulation of three, but also the addition of what's called a rose window. And if you look close at this, uh, let's get a little closer with Arid Extra Dry. There you can see the rose window has been organized into three sections. 
Remember, the circle is the sign of God, the unbroken, perfect shape that has been used before in Egypt to symbolize the god Aten, the sun gods being shown as a disk, whether it's Helios or even in the eye of Jupiter. The circle is an unbroken, perfect, and infinite shape. Now, thinking about the, the Christian language of uh, visual communication, the Christian visual language, rather, I want you to be aware of the breaking down of that shape into three segments. Of course, we have the circle in the middle. Then you have these 12 segments here, which would allude to the 12 disciples, the 12 disciples of Christ. Looking inside, it's easy to imagine how small one might feel in this space, how, how small one might feel before the power of Christ. So, from that we enter the age of cathedrals. And while many people might talk about uh, Notre Dame, I prefer to uh, discuss and focus Chartres. Uh, deceit of the bishop. This massive undertaking and beautiful building, which overlooked its city, would become much like a mascot. You know, think about not just the people that brought it, that that were brought into the city, but think about the money that those people brought, or the money that changed hands to make this building possible. Not just at Chartres, but in all of the cathedrals. The clergy themselves would give up their salary to help fund these massive buildings, and wealthy and poor alike would donate to these to the construction of these uh, buildings. Uh, it is the, the loaning out, or the doling out, or the paying, the donating of these funds and building the church that leads up to something that we discuss in Western Civ, and that is the selling of indulgences. If you would, imagine some wealthy benefactor who's living a not-so-ideal life. He says to the clergy, listen... You know, I'm a man of God, just like you. I just, you know, things are really tight right now. So uh, how can I help you build this building? You know, would a, would a thousand gold ducats help? Or, or perhaps 5,000 guilders? You know, what kind of money do I need? What kind of money do you need to help make this thing possible? And so the person donates some money. Then they talk about perhaps things going on in their life. Some people donated to make these buildings possible simply out of faith, true faith and devotion. Other people donated because they wanted fame, recognition, they wanted absolution, and they wanted to sleep good at night. So they would try and get in good with the church by donating money. Overhead, we can see that Chartres has the clear cruciform design. It has the crossing, it has you know, the pronounced narthex, it has the towers, the gabled roof, and the rose window, but we can also see it's a rather bulky building and the facades are not necessarily symmetrical. Why could that be? You know, if, if this is such a big building, why do the towers look different? Why is this narthex, why is this entrance so much more pronounced in comparison to the others? Well, there, of course, is a reason. Um, the most obvious reason being money. Maybe they ran out of money. Maybe they had more money in one year versus another. Perhaps they had more materials, or perhaps there was a different artist working on it at the time, or a different guild. When we look at these two towers, we can see that one is taller and more complex. We can see that one is more solid and is shorter, which leads one to wonder which one came first. Well, the truth is the one on the right came first. Looking at this next uh, slide, I want to direct you to some of the key elements in this diagram. You no longer have to email me for a copy of the picture. If you download the PowerPoint, you will have access to a very large file in this very large diagram of Chartres. And when you look at it, I think you'll see that it identifies parts that you already recognize, you already understand. So when I ask you, where is the archivolts in this portal or in this facade, you can tell me that there are the archivolts there. 
whereas before we might think of it as an arch, you know, that is true. Um, if it was simply a structure and it was an, a vital part of the structure, that might be recognized as an arch. But in this case, as a purely formal and decorative element, we usually refer to it as an archivolt. And beneath the archivolt is the tympanum, and then we have the lintel. And then flanking the doors, of course, are the door jams. Please make note of the scale of the door in relation to the person, the modern person. When we look up close, we can see a lot of detail going into this work. We can see that parts of the sculptures look rather crude. Uh, we can also see some adaptations of things from the f ancient Near East to the ancient Far East. One in particular is the use of the full body halo. Of course, Christ will always have the halo around his head, but here we have an additional halo setting him apart. And the name of that full body halo is Mandorla. Christ, as well, is being flanked by uh, the Power Rangers. No, he is being flanked by the four evangelists. And you can find in your textbook, in the Christian chapter, a uh, caption as an end and illustration detailing who the four evangelists are. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and which one is which. For example, the painter and saint of painters, the bull, Saint Luke, or the evangelist, the apostle, Luke. Uh, from that, we can see a familiar pose, a familiar scene of Christ sitting in Mary's lap. Very f uh, typical, uh, typical scene, uh, but Christ sitting in his mother's lap, what is that all about? Well, what you need to remember is this. While according to the Bible, according to the Christian faith, Christ is the salvation of man, the Redeemer, but he is born of man, so he's sitting in Mary's lap, and it references that he is a child of man, but he is also the Son of God. Why is he shown as a man? Because by showing this baby as a man, it alludes to his destiny. Yes, he is the child of Mary, but he, Christ, will grow into the man that saves all of us. And again, this is according to the Christian faith. Um, obviously, she is flanked. They are flanked by two angels, most likely one of them being the archangel Gabriel, who first announced to Mary that she would give birth to the, the Son of God and the Savior of all mankind. And you can see that one hand is slightly raised and the other not so much. We can see that more prominently here. It is this sculpture, it is this work here, that I want you to be aware of when you think about this next slide, and that is the South and the West. Which one came first? Well, if you think about it, it should be easy. Remember that in Rome, you had all of this classical knowledge, all of these incredible techniques that the Greeks, of course, mastered and the Romans copied. And so for many years, the Romans made their great Greek influence, their Greek-taught works of art, in stone. Well, with the fall of the Roman Empire, all that knowledge, or much of that knowledge, was lost, or cancelled out, or flat-out destroyed, as well as examples of this work being destroyed. It's a sad tragedy. It's a sad thing, obviously, but it makes sense when you look at these west-facing um, sculptures. You can see that Prozac-like smile, the crude kind of pattern of lines that are meant to symbolize flowing folds of cloth. If we think back to one of the previous chapters, we can see those same elements happening there. So man is, in fact, rebuilding the wheel and relearning those techniques which made works before so incredible. And we can see that learning and that development in the south facade and the sculptures there, which have a more natural, more relaxed pose. The faces are not all the same with the, the goofy smile, and they, in fact, have their own sort of personality. One added factor is how halos are portrayed. Whereas before, the halo was this flat disc behind the head of the person, they here are using the architectural element above them to show halos. 
And so as you're standing in front of you know, this sculpture, you can see the halo there, but as you walk by, the halo continues because of the changing angles of the structure above them. And that shadow that's cast by the structure above them, it helps bring more attention to the head of the saint or whoever is in the sculpture, which is really, really quite clever. That's one of my favorite things about this building. So before we go to the next slide, think about what I said before. Use your imagination. Imagine you are a serf or a servant or a slave in this time, and all you know is muddy and weathered and gray and dull. Well, well, that may be. Christianity, according to its faith, according to its work, book of uh, knowledge, it promises life everlasting. And it has this building that reminds you, the viewer, the audience member, that through Christ there is salvation. So they design the church like Christ. You enter the body of Christ, you consume the body of Christ, and drink the blood of Christ. Well, to add additional effect to that, they talk about the glory of heaven. They talk about the glory, then the richness that you may have on the inside. And so where this is the outside of the building, on the inside is this. You can see on the colonnettes and the clustered compound pier how the lights, how the light from outside is used to cast color on everything inside like a casino that overwhelms its guests with light and with sound and with dazzling effects. Imagine if you could, imagine if you would, the changing lights of the interior as clouds moved over, the changing lights of the interior as candles and lamps and small fires danced about. That is truly an astounding environment that would easily overwhelm anyone not accustomed to this type of decoration and space. Throughout the rose windows and decorations of the stained glass, you will see the sacred geometry, the, the numbers being repeated, the ideas, and it helps to drive home those key concepts for the illiterate, those that can't read. You have again the circle, you have the division within the circle, and you have something else you have a very strange symbol that doesn't have its roots in the Bible or in the story of Christ. And that symbol is the fleur-de-lis. Okay, so why would you put the fleur-de-lis in with images of Christ? Well, when you think about it, it's actually quite clever and important. What it means is it is a chance for the king to portray himself as religious. And as people sit in that church, worshiping their god, they're also, in a way, worshiping the symbol of the king. And so the king no longer has to fight with the church. He simply projects himself as a pious man. And as people are worshiping the Lord, they're also recognizing the symbol and the, the influence of King Louis. The typical colors of the Gothic period and Gothic stained glass are blue and red. Whereas the colors of King Louis is blue and gold. Sorry about that, I had to uh, clear my throat. Uh, so we were talking about the colors of King Louis, we are talking about the colors of the Gothic st stained glass. One interesting thing to note, one really unique thing to note about the Gothic uh, time of stained glass is that we don't know how they made those colors. You know, we can make our own stained glass, but we have lost knowledge of the recipe in which they made their blues, their reds, their golds, and so forth and so on. It's a really interesting thing uh, that speaks to their techniques and their understanding of chemicals. When you think about uh, with all of our technological might and, and um, resources, we can't reproduce something so simple as red stained glass from the uh, Gothic period. Moving on, Think about, you know, what's happened at this massive cathedral. It's beautiful. It's something to bring all of the people together. And it is impressive, no doubt. But, well, that's just one city. 
So let's compare. Let's, for example, for example, say maybe there's a new cathedral in BB, which is 200 meters tall, or no, 100 meters tall. That's a pretty big building. But the people in Lone Oak, well, they want something a little more. They're saying, well, if those people have, those people in BB got that, then we got to have something about 105 meters tall. Uh, I'm not, I'm just, I can't sleep right. I've got to have a taller building than BB. They're not so hot. So, if you would, imagine how all those cities throughout France would feel if one city has one cathedral that's so tall or so beautiful and so colorful. Well, if you're living in another city, then you want something better. You want more height and light. Thus, the age of cathedrals turns into a massive arms race. As these cathedrals compete to touch the hand and the face of God by searching higher and higher and allowing more and more light into these sacred spaces. Well, that's really what happened. And as we move to Rams, we find just how massive they can get. Compare, if you would, this little dot, which is a person, and this massive door. Now more than ever, in this Gothic style, we can imagine how small one is meant to feel before the almighty power of God and his faithful. Just like those people uh, making their sculptures out of rough stone with very few tools, these buildings are acts of devotion. Devotion for some and greed for others. Greed for absolution so they may sin and do what they want or for something else. As I mentioned before, in, in, in different countries, we would have very different influences. At Salisbury Cathedral, we have the normal two towers, the, the rectangular building, and the gabled roof in the middle. But they have added a third tower, a third spire, at the crossing. You can see that here with the development of the spire and the crossing here at the lower transept, but they've added a second transept, which really more looks like one of the eastern or uh, non-traditional crosses you might see in the States. Uh, you know, typically when we think of a cross, it's a large T, but this is one of the many types of crosses out there. One addition that Salisbury has that other cathedrals don't necessarily have is the cloister. A cloister is a uh, a, typically a square path, an enclosed courtyard where the outside wall is closed off, there are no windows, and the interior wall has open windows and sp open spaces, so one may walk in a circle meditating or praying while reflecting and enjoying the beauty of nature in the courtyard. To understand what a cloister really looks like, then you may simply watch one of the Harry Potter movies. There are several scenes that take place in the cloisters of Hogwarts, uh, Hogwarts uh, school. So, as I said, the different uh, cities throughout France and in some other cities would compete for taller, more magnificent buildings. Enter the Rayonnant style, specifically the Chapel of Saint-Chapelle. The rayonnant refers to rays of light shooting forth. And when you look at this, you realize now that Gothic buildings really didn't need the stone webbing. Because of its reliance upon pointed arches and ribbed vaults, they could put anything in there. So they took out the bricks and they added more and more glass, going for taller and taller spaces with more and more light and color to go in and dazzle. To give you an example, let's look at a recent close-up of the interior of Saint-Chapelle. And here we are. The gold, the color, the dazzling light. Now more than ever, I ask you to consider using your imagination and imagine how this space might have looked in a time before electricity, when in place of candles there would have been dancing lights, and outside those windows of that chapel would have been moving, shifting clouds. Think about how the sun from the sunset would capture the light in those windows, and think about how, you know, the lower section does not have that illumination, does not have that gold. So on the bottom we have, in essence, the world of man. 
plain, solid, reaching for the heavens in each of those pointed arches, and above the world of man is a single place for the priest to preach the word of God as a conduit from heaven down to earth. This is the culmination of decades of uh, construction and innovation both in stained glass and in construction of building and masonry. Think about all the money that went into this and try to imagine just for a moment how expensive a building like this might cost now. And then when you think about that, you gain a little more insight into just what was happening in these cathedrals. Saint-Chapelle in Paris. So, was anything else happening during the Gothic period? Yes, of course. Books were becoming more and more uh, complex. There were more numbers of books being made, but most of those books were biblical. They were books of prayers, psalms or psalters. There were Bibles themselves, but what we have here in this book of psalms is a picture of the King Louis. The King Louis. Sorry, I didn't mean the King Louis. I meant the King, comma, Louis. Here he is on his knees, on a rocky uh, peak, on a field of the fleur-de-lis, the symbol of his uh, royalty. The blue and gold is a field for Christ in his mandorla, seemingly sitting down and holding the world in his hands, blesses or anoints King Louis. So once again, the crown, which before was rejecting the cross, which was rejecting religion, is now working with religion to better control the people, to pacify the people, and to validate their rule over the people. Remember how all of this is based around original, t original ideas and techniques and materials that were developed earlier. What they're doing now is simply innovating rather than creating something new. Important words to remember for this chapter, of course, are armature, compound pier, and cluster pier, flying buttresses, guild, masterpiece, and ribbed vault. Tracery we looked at from Rome, so it's certainly worth being aware of. I'd like to remind you what a clustered pier looks like. It looks like a group of small piers, a group of columns coming together like a plant. It's most easily seen at Rams Cathedral, the columns here like a tree trunk reaching up into smaller colonnettes. The colonnettes, the more decorative, much smaller columns compared to main columns. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me and consider dropping by the office where I can walk you through the chapter. If you want to copy my notes, you may, but also please remember to check out the online quizzes. That's it for now. Thank you for your interest, and I'll see you in class.